Hello and welcome everyone to today's Fairy God Boss Live webinar. We're going to take just a few minutes to wait for a few other individuals to join us um, and connect. But while we're waiting, we'd love to know where everyone's tuning in from today. So if you can use the chat on the right hand side of your screen and just let us know where you're joining us from, either company or city state location. Hi, Bernadette from Denver, same as us. April from Texas, welcome. A few representing from Texas, that's fabulous. Long Beach, California, I'm a SoCal girl myself originally, welcome. Randy, I know you, welcome. New Jersey, Minneapolis, excellent. So I see we have a lot of folks here from all over, which is really nice to see. Um, so let's get started. First, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Carrie Carley, Talent Acquisition uh, Vice President at Dish Network. And before we get started, I just wanna share a few um, standards and announcements. This session will be recorded and will be shared via email to all registrants. Um, if that bothers you, you, we will not be offended. You're welcome to um, leave the, the session itself. During the discussion, we'd like to hear from you. So we'd like to um, ask you to use the chat on the right-hand side, just as you're um, sharing where you're from. And we will take uh, questions from the comments box. We'll start with a few scheduled or planned questions to start out and then we'll stop in the middle and take any questions from the audience here as well. Uh, we would like this to be interactive um, as much as possible and this is really for you overall. I'm now excited to kick off today's event which uh, the title of it is How to Build Your Brand and Claim a Seat at the Table. It is sponsored by Dish Network, the company that we work for. For those of you who do not know, uh, Fairy God Boss is the largest career community for women. Millions of women visit Fairy God Boss for career connections, job, community advice, hard to find information, um, and how companies treat women um, overall. And they, they uh, schedule a number of these virtual events um, as well throughout the year. I'm thrilled to be joined by three of my colleagues, Nadia, Liz, and Kara. And would ask each of them to take a few minutes to share a little bit uh, personal, professional about um, each one of you. So we can start with Nadia. Great. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I'm Nadia Allen, Senior Manager of Product Operations. And a little bit about how my journey started. I got my undergrad in biology, which clearly I'm not using here at Dish Network. Um, but I, I knew that I wanted to do something with technology. So I was working various jobs in project management, business analysis, different things like that. And about 20 years ago, so yes, I'm dating myself, but 20 years ago, I made the leap from a small startup technology company because I wanted to start something new. And at that time, Dish and DirecTV were in talks to possibly merge. Some of you may remember that, but that was a really long time ago. And I had an opportunity to come over as a manager and manage a testing team. And so I was really excited just about the opportunity, learn something new, stretch my leadership skills. So that's a little bit about how I got started. Thank you. Liz, how about you? Sure. Um, I, I'm Liz Riemersman. I'm the Vice President of Strategy, Business Development and International for our pay TV business. Um, my career is really honestly very nonlinear, uh, so it can be hard to sort of piece together the different the different the different elements of it. Uh, I you know I started out in real estate, went back to business school to get an MBA at that time in e-commerce, which I don't think even exists as a specialization anymore because I'm I'm truly dating myself, Nadia. Um, and then uh, and then went into the field of database marketing, uh, predictive analytics, and digital. My husband and I then decided uh, we wanted to live abroad. So we ended up moving to Dubai uh, and we lived and worked in Dubai for 11 years. Uh, and I worked, at, worked both for the ruler of Dubai and then I worked for a mobile brand that was distributing offer content throughout 17 markets in the Asia, Middle East, Africa and Europe. Um, 
around 2015, 2016, we started to think about, hey, maybe it's time to move back to the States. We had uh, had our son uh, while we lived in Dubai. We wanted him to know what it was to to grow up in, in the U.S. and understand what it was to be American. And just at that moment, this job came up at Dish Network uh, that was to head up marketing uh, with it for our international business. Um, and I really leapt at the opportunity. So I came to Dish with actually no industry experience uh, and actually having have, have lived in, in overseas for a, a substantial amount of time. Uh, um, but Dish has been an amazing amazing company to work for and I've been able to really grow and evolve my skills uh, since, mm -hmm. since being here. Thank you. And Kara. Awesome. Thanks. I'll go next. So I'll give you a little bit of background. I grew up in the Midwest, went to Illinois State University to become a teacher. Um, started to volunteer during my teaching program and realized I don't have enough patience to do this. And so I realized very quickly I needed to change majors and so swapped over to business, um, ended up in marketing, which is kind of my niche and my passion. Um, had visited Colorado during my lifetime to ski here and about three weeks after graduation decided that I wanted to come here. Um, so my first job out of school, I worked at a local newspaper selling advertising space in that marketing realm. Um, loved it, loved Colorado, uh, but realized that I couldn't survive on $9 an hour, which also dates me <laughs> as well. Um, so joined a company down in Colorado Springs called Checks Unlimited, which is a banking financial institution that prints checks and was part of a leadership development program there, was there about 10 years, had about 11, 12 roles from marketing to operations, to sales, to call center. Um, to manufacturing and operations. And it really allowed me to get my hands into what do I like and what do I don't like. Um, so stayed there for about 10, 11 years, um, realized marketing and operations was kind of my gig. And from that, um, had always been checking out Dish and came to the customer attention department because of the fact that it fit that need of both marketing and operations at the time um, and have been at Dish now about 17 and a half years. So that's kind of my background in a nutshell of, of why and how I ended up here. Well, and I want to share, I think um, I always tell Kara, she has the coolest job ever. Um, and I don't know if people know, but she deals with people like the Property Brothers. Um, some of my favorites, um, I always see pictures of you on um, social media, hobnobbing yeah. with Jonathan and Drew. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's definitely fun. Definitely fun, but I will walk through some of the challenges that I had with that <laughs> part of the process. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'll um, just share a little bit about myself as well. I get to be both a facilitator of this and also share a bit of feedback um, in addition. So um, I've been in um, HR for the last 30 years. Um, uh, I started my career during a recession in the early 90s and it was really hard to find a job. Um, but I really got into um, HR because my mom was in HR and um, she was a big um, influence on my life but being a career woman um, during a time where most of my friends moms didn't work um, and so it was a little different my mom was the breadwinner of the family and so she was a great influence on me um, and i naturally fell into hr but i started working as a um, agency recruiter and then moved into um, uh, really recruitment technology um, when the first dot-com boom was starting in um, in Silicon Valley, so Northern California. I mentioned I'm originally from San Diego. Um, and that really kind of moved me around all aspects of HR and talent acquisitions. So I saw things from the agency side, kind of the service side, then um, recruitment technology, as again, as a service provider, process improvements, then to um, HR outsourcing and recruitment process outsourcing to then in-house, which is a little bit of a different um, career track for people who are in HR. Usually they start in HR and then go outside to be a service provider. And I did just the opposite from the outside in. Um, but I felt like that really has helped me think about things from more of a commercial uh, viewpoint and perspective from the outside in rather than inside out, um, which HR can tend to um, get stuck in many ways. Um, so I try and think about things from um, kind of a consumer perspective, um, the products and services that we deliver from an in-house standpoint. Um, what attracted me to DISH really, which I know you guys have shared some of that, was um, I 
um, was already living um, in the Denver area. We had um, I'd gone west coast, east coast, and then back to kind of the middle, which this is more westish to me. Um, and um, I was really looking for um, the opportunity to be able to work and live in the same city of the headquarters of the company I was working for. And Dish had a really interesting proposition with the growth and build out of the wireless business. Um, I tend to be more of a change agent and like to be on the forefront of change. So it was really exciting to me to be able to be a part of that from um, an HR perspective to help transform the business overall. So that's what attracted me to DISH. Um, so I'm gonna, uh, many of you already shared more of how you ended up coming to DISH. So I'm gonna skip to the next question, which is really, um, what skills do you believe have helped you most throughout your career? Um, so, Nadia, I'm going to start with you again. Okay, great. Uh, there's a lot of skills, but if I had to narrow it down to just a handful, I would say being adaptable, being flexible, agile. I know over the years that I've been at DISH, which is 20 years, uh, technology has changed, business needs have changed, as competition changes, and I've been able to, to change, right, as, as times have changed. So staying adaptable and... I would also add my work ethic. I feel like I'm a person who has a lot of grit, perseverance, gone through a lot of challenging things in my personal life, professional life. And I think at the end of the day, whether it's, you know, staying late, putting in extra hours on the weekends. I know, Carrie, you do a lot of that and travel. Uh, I do those things because I care about the product. I care about our customer impact. And it's not because I'm getting paid overtime. You know, I'm, I'm salaried. But to me, my work ethic has definitely carried me a long way. And then lastly, I would say optimism and humor. I think that in, in business and in life, having a, a, a glass always half full, right, you know, mentality has helped me overcome some of those challenges. So those are just a few of the things that I think that have helped me in my career professionally, as well as personally. Yeah, that resonates with me. Kara, how about you? Yeah. I have a lot of the same ones that, that Nadja has too. <laughs> but, um, I, you know, when I was thinking about the question, tenacity was the first thing that came to my mind of doing whatever it takes to get the job done or to push through that barrier or to work through conflict or to, you know, to get to that finish line. Um, those are some of the things that have made myself, you know, when I think about my career, made me really successful here. Uh, but in the, the previous jobs that I've had as well, um, I kind of have a mindset of you do whatever it takes to get the job done. Um, and sometimes that is more hours and sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's working through difficult situations. But tenacity is probably the biggest thing. You know, I, I love to win sometimes at all costs, which, you know, there's there's pros and cons to that. Um, but I, I have a willingness to drive towards that finish line and, and do whatever it takes. Um, I don't give up high energy you have to have high energy you know like i've i've always had high energy my entire career um sometimes my employees will say i'm too high energy that i need to slow down a little bit but i'm always walking fast i'm always like on to the next thing um that's kind of how i work hard work ethic you know not just talked about that it that's been a skill that i've always had it's ingrained in me how i grew up you know carrie you talked about your mom like it's i had the same thing in my household it was a you're going to go to school, you're going to be successful. A lot of those work ethic traits were, were from how I grew up in my household. Um, and fun. We like to have a lot of fun. I think it's really important to have fun in the workplace. We work really hard, really, really hard here. And you have to be able to have fun or to goof off or to, you know, be goofy in the workplace environment because there's got to be a balance to that. And so those are some of the skills that I think about, um, over time, like I've built, I, I have, I kind of live and breathe on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, that's great. I'd probably just add a couple more because um, I yeah, definitely am me too. Um, but I'd say, you know, one thing that I think is really important, especially I'm going to say for women in general is, um, but advice for everyone, um, dress for the part that you want, not the part that you have. Um, you know, I found that you know, if you aspire to something different, right, kind of act as though you're in that part. Um, you know, people get promoted um, really for the work that they've been doing and they eventually get the promotion that they are looking for. You don't just, you're not just given the promotion and then you start doing the work. It's always the reverse. And so I think it's always important, you know, take on more work, um, dress for the part that you want to have. Um, and that's also act and do 
that part as well. Um, Liz, is there anything else you'd add? Yeah, I would say, I mean, I, I would, everything that has been mentioned, I agree with. Um, I would also add resilience and just the ability to continuously roll with changes has been extremely helpful for me personally. Um, this, I tend to be adventurous, super comfortable with situations where I don't have like the full picture or the information and the task is to figure out, find out, find out how, why, how do you succeed? Um, and then I think, uh, again, I would say uh, tenacity and being able to contextualize information in a way that makes sense, right? That's really critical to my job um, because a lot of the times we are, you know, we're negotiating with people who are far more comfortable far more powerful from a com company standpoint. So you need to be able to understand the the overall context if you're making if you're if you're if you're entering into that fray. Um, and those those are really those are skills that have really stuck with me and have helped helped guide me to where I am. Yeah. When I say in that case, you know, have a thick skin, that's hard yeah. to say, but this is business. Nothing's yeah. personal, even not though we personal. have a tendency to take things personally, but right. it's not personal. That's and right. I'm just trying to compartmentalize that and recognize that. Yeah. Um, so the next question, I'm going to start with you again, Liz. We'll go a little bit backwards. Um, I think this is a really important one. Um, if you can share any specific challenges or obstacles you faced as a woman in your industry, um, how'd you overcome them? Um, and, you know, is there anything from a career perspective that is... Um, you found most helpful from a support standpoint? Yeah, I mean, I think that the challenge, uh, the primary challenge I see, uh, and, and it continues to be a challenge, is uh, in our in industry, the representation uh, of, of anyone other than a white, white, older white dudes <laughs> is not great. Um, and I do, I'm a firm believer that representation matters. Like it is something that creates value for companies. It creates value for organizations and bringing in diverse perspectives. Um, and I think that, um, you know, that, that to me is really central when I'm looking at my team, the composite of the people I have on my team and, and what, um, who I want to bring to the table. Um, it really does factor into my decision making. Uh, I want to make sure that I'm getting diverse perspectives, um, that I'm getting input from people uh, who who have a different point of view. It's very important. I think we get to much better decisions financially as a company, et cetera, when you're actually your starting point is from there. Dish has been incredibly um, supportive in that. In that, really, that's a, that is a, a a goal across the board from recruitment. So. Uh, my partners in recruitment have been extremely helpful in, in helping me uh, when I'm targeting talent and looking at talent to bring into the organization in, in putting that additional lens really uh, on who we are looking at and who, who we're considering. Um, it, and it's not something, and it's not, I wouldn't say like, it's obviously not a quota or anything, but it is something that we do take extra time with the recruitment team to make sure that we are getting the most comprehensive diverse offering of candidates that we have coming in uh, and and then we are bringing them through the process it's an it's an it's an equal process um, but but we will, our starting point has to be a, a diverse candidate pool mm -hmm. right uh, and, and the 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 carry your team specifically has been enormously helpful in, in in how we do that and how we create that pool well thanks for the flag I appreciate yeah. it <laughs> <laughs> um, Kara, any, I, I think your industry is very um, interesting, also male dominated. Yeah. And any perspective or you can share about your obstacles? Yeah, you know, I think Liz mentioned it. Uh, being here 17 and a half years, I've watched this business change dramatically. Um, we don't have a good balance here of, um, you know, male versus female leadership representation. Um, it's been a challenge. And to Liz's point, it's being very mindful of that as you're making decisions and hiring and and you know those are some of the challenges. I've been in many meetings here where I've been the only female in the room, where it's a room of 50 guys. And it's the challenge of having people understand in that setting that, no, I'm not the one running the slides because I'm the female sitting in the corner. I'm presenting the slides because I have a strategy that needs to be approved. And so you know, I've always had really strong leadership around me, both men and women, that have supported you know, my growth here to say, no, you're just as important as the 50 guys in the room right now. Um, but it is uncomfortable. And it's some of those challenges that you have to work through to say, I'm just as important as the people sitting in this room. And, 
um, getting some of that confidence. It's taken me a really long time over my career to, to kind of get comfortable with that at times to say, no, I'm just as, I'm just as important as some of these people in the room. But um, it has been challenging because you have a, a level of confidence that you have a little bit of a, of a, of a moment where you're like, wow, seriously, I'm the only one in this room right now. Um, but I've, I've learned to kind of feed off that over time. And then, you know, I've also learned to say, I have the confidence and I have the business expertise to where I can do this. Um, and it's, but it's taken time. It's definitely taken time. Yeah. So, um, I'd, I'd love to take a break and see if there are any um, questions from the audience here. Uh, please feel free to add them in the comments that are on the right hand side. Um, we'll keep going with questions, um, in the meantime, but, um, if, if you have a question for, for our panel, please let us know. So the next question while we're waiting for any questions that come through from the audience um, is really how do you suggest individuals approach situations where they may not be initially invited to the table, but know their input is valuable? Um, so this is probably a little bit different, Kara, from what you were talking about, which is you're already, you're talking about challenges where you're already at the table, but how do you get yourself invited to the table and maybe start start with Nadia. Sure thing, and and I agree with I echo what some of the ladies have already mentioned. But I think finding those niches where you can make an influence, right? You can be an influence of you know a change agent, if you will. I think Liz mentioned, you know, it's often easier to get things done when you have support, right? Rather than being that sole person banging on the door. So. If you have a mentor, an advisor, a sponsor, someone who maybe you can share a proposal with, you know, how do I get a seat at that table? How can I maybe present these ideas? And, and maybe you might have to join a few committees. Maybe you might have to go to a few meetings that might be outside of your realm of your normal business responsibilities, but just to network and get yourself out there. And then you've established kind of a brand, if you will, where then maybe you can be invited to the table. Because more people have seen what you bring to the table and in your skill set and your knowledge and things like that. So I think finding someone who can help, right, and support and help you kind of break through that door. That's great. So Kara, flip side. Yeah. Getting invited to the, the yeah. table. Yeah. Uh, I, I may have a, a stronger approach to this, but ask. Ask the question. I want to be in the meeting. I want to be at the table. Yeah. But the worst is going to happen. You're going to be told no. That's sort of where you're at today. And so I always have a philosophy of being confident enough to ask the question, to say, I want to be there. And here's why. Let me tell you why. Um, again, worst thing is you're going to be told no. And then you can go through that process of learning and understanding, like, how do you get there? Um, but I always, I always have an approach of ask because I haven't asked before in my career and I've had the moment where I'm like, why didn't I stick up for myself and just say, why can't I be there? Can I, can I at least listen in? Maybe I'm not presenting this time, but can I at least listen in and understand how the process works? And so that's sort of my philosophy of be confident, get yourself at, you know, get yourself to that point um, to be invited um, and, and surround yourself, like Nadja mentioned, with people that support you and can communicate to you the whys and the whys, why nots, but I always am persistent. Ask, insert yourself, try to get to that table. That's what yeah. I would say. That's excellent. So we have a couple questions that have come in. So let me start with the first one. Um, first one is from Anne. Um, what broad tips or advice can each of you share on how to balance competing priorities, professional and personal? So Liz, why don't we start with you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the starting point is self-acceptance, right? <laughs> you have to be in a place where you're like, this is not going to be perfect, right? I think work-life balance is a really hard, elusive thing. Um, and we as women tend to be really hard on ourselves um, about everything. So if you have a starting point of, hey, this is what my life looks like now. This is how I'm going to manage it. This is how I'm going to carve out time. That's healthier because if you're entering into it thinking like the you, you I want something that is, you know, really well defined and very well carved out and and everything is going to be, you know, 30% of my time at home and 70% professional, you're just never going to get there. So you have to be able to be 
comfortable with imperfection and 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 being able to say okay um what is really important what's primary what am i going to prioritize on both sides and then be comfortable with letting other stuff go right because there's just no way you can do it all <laughs> there's just no way and i think the problem is is like we as women put so much more pressure on ourselves to get and I think, you know, typically our, our male counterparts or colleagues or partners do. Um, but there is a real a release in being able to say, I'm not going to be perfect. It's just not going to happen. I'm going to prioritize the most important things and everything else is just not happening this week or month yeah. or year. <laughs> I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. Um, I use the term a lot, like, just give yourself grace. Um, and I, I think women need to give themselves grace and others, right, more so, um, especially when you don't have children or family and, you know, you really want to make your children your priority um, rather than work. And that's really hard to do for w working women. Um, and I remember trying to make through that transition. I have a 13 year old boy, one. Uh, it doesn't make it any easier whether you have one or ten. Um, <laughs> whatever it is, I'm always amazed at people who have more than one. No, um, me too. But, yes, um, I also have a thirteen-year-old boy. <laughs> you do yeah. perfect. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I'll just even use an example. Um, last night, like this week, happens to be, um, you know, I had a wedding I had to go to in California on a Monday. Crazy, um, and then trying to do work, and I have like five presentations I have to do this week. Um, this is not one of them. And, um, but there were, you know, it was all stacked up. And last night I just realized, you know what, I'm, I'm giving a presentation on employee experience and I was going to put together this amazing deck and, you know, I've done all of the research. I just need to put together the deck and I just couldn't get it done. And I was last night thinking, what am I going to do? And I thought, you know what, I'm just going to go back to basics. I'm just going to use the tool and I'm going to be even more transparent. I'm going to show, you know, the Qualtrics tool to my team rather than just worry about this deck. And I, I'm thinking actually they're going to probably find more value in it in, at the end of the day. Um, so it's one of those things where you just have to say it's it's not necessarily how I plan to do it, but I figured out another alternative and I'm not staying up till midnight to do it. Um, so one of those things. Um, that's great. Does anyone else want to chime in? Before there, We have a lot more questions that are coming through for the team from the audience, I should say. Okay, so let me cover a couple here. Um, what advice would you recommend to young women who are just starting their careers? Nadia, maybe we'll start with you. Yeah, sure thing. And it, when you're first starting, I know when I first started, I didn't really know what path I was taking. I just knew two things, that I wanted to work hard and I wanted to lead people. Those were the only things that I knew. And uh, I kind of just got in, did the work, and I found I started to gravitate to, you know, whether it be projects or committees, I started volunteering, I started getting more involved, right? And I, I did some networking, some mentoring, but I would say, get involved, stay active, be curious, as, as, as Kara mentioned. Um, I know when I found like the things that I, I was passionate about, the things where I found I could be a support to someone else, um, ended up leading me to, you know, I, I helped co-found a DEIB group, right? And Liz, I mean, you talked about the importance of diversity and inclusion. I think that's truly important. Um, you know, I volunteer for groups and part of several ERGs. And so in a way I've kind of created a brand, you know, and I, and I didn't necessarily seek that path, but I just gravitated to the things where I'm passionate or I can help people. Um, so when you're first starting, don't typecast yourself, right? Just be open, be willing to say yes to things, right? Like Kara mentioned, ask, right? Say yes to things. Don't always sit back and say, oh, somebody else can do that, right? Somebody else can lead that. No, maybe I want to put my name in the ring. Maybe I want to put my name in the hat and volunteer. And the more you do that, the more confidence you get. And I mean, ultimately, like, it's the best way to, to get recognized, to get noticed, to get promoted. So I would say, you know, earlier in your career, just make sure you're active and you're saying yes and you're staying curious. And That's terrific. So I'm going to just, we have a lot coming in, so I'm just going to um, throw it out to each one of you individually. Um, here's another one. Um, Liz, maybe you can take this one. 
Could you provide some guidance on the importance of online presence and personal branding in the digital age? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I think it's a, to, in my mind, it's a layer, right? So your personal brand, if I like peel back that idea, it, it, it really means your promise, right? It, and when you're, when you are, um, like, for example, if you're p putting together a brand as a, cons for a consumer, you want to put together something that's actually going to deliver on what the product is. So for me, personal brand means who am I? What do I want to do? What am I doing now? What do I want to do? Uh, you know, who am I in the, who am I in the workplace? It may not include actually my, my personal life. Um, but that's kind of the core, right? So if, if you know what that is and, and you know, um, that piece that helps you navigate the workplace, right? In terms of where am I going to declare my interests? Where do I want to, you know, have those conversations with my manager about where I want to grow, what skills I want to learn, that sort of thing that kind of reinforce this idea of who I am and what and, and where I'm going. The online presence piece of it is really more about amplifying what who you are out in the organization, at least that's the way I see it, right? So it's, it's important um, in that, you know, we are all, uh, we are all in the course of our careers going to switch jobs. We're going to switch companies. Um, it's important for you to be able to, to uh, let people know what that is outside of your company. Um, and, and the other piece of it as well is if, if you're doing, if your job is something where you're dealing with business partners, it's, it's actually not a bad idea for them to know who you are prior to engaging as well. So for me, it's something that um, I seek to amplify the pieces of, of my work or my team's work, actually more importantly, um, that I am proud of, that align to you know what we are trying to achieve as an organization, what I'm trying to achieve professionally and where we're trying to develop. So if I'm doing posts on LinkedIn, it means I, I'm probably focusing on things that have to do with furthering other dishes objectives, my team's objectives, our work, et cetera. And, and typically calling out the great efforts uh, and collaboration that we find within our teammates, right? That's a, that to me is like the greatest place you can go to celebrate the people who work for you or you work with as well. So uh, it's kind of a long answer, but that, that's, that's great. Yeah. And to be authentic. Yeah, yeah. totally. You not can't so be like, it can't be not you. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Kara, we'll go to you with the next one. Um, when you ask and you give a why, what's a good way to approach that you don't seem only driven by self-interest? If you want to learn and grow, you want visibility, is it seen as all about you? Are there other points to build in? Yeah, that's a great question. Sometimes it comes across that way, you know, it's a, I want to sit at the table and it's okay to say, yeah, I, it is about me. I want to sit at the table. So having some of that honest conversation, which, you know, it's a great question, but I think ultimately at the end of the day, when I think about the experiences I've had here at DISH, it's demonstrating the value that you bring. So let me give you an example. It could be a, hey, I know I may not be ready to present my idea, you are going to be the one presenting that idea, but I want to come into the room and and listen and watch and understand business dynamics and how you're presenting the information so I know how to do that next time. And so sometimes it's just as easy as just um, asking some of those questions and inserting yourself to say, here's the value that I can bring at some point. But right now, that may not be today, but here's what I'm trying to do today. I'm trying to learn. I'm trying to understand how the, how these sorts of meetings work. So going forward, I do have a seat at the table, um, but it is a little bit self-serving and that's okay. You should be surrounding yourself with a leadership team or um, your boss or your mentor, or whoever that understands, you know, Liz's point, why you're here and have, have that leadership structure understand how to support you going forward. And it's okay to say, this is about me. I want to learn and I want to grow here and I may not be ready to do that right at this moment, however I want to at some point. And so it is the responsibility of that leadership team or mentor or boss or whoever to help with that. And if you're underneath a structure that they're constantly telling you, nope, 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 I would question to say, are you in the right leadership team and in the right structure and in the right company? And it's hard because a lot of us have been there 
and you're constantly told no and you're like is it me it may not be you it may be somebody else and it's important <laughs> yeah. to understand that dynamic at times and be comfortable yeah. to say this is about me so going back to that question and being able to champion yourself as a person especially female in an environment like we work here at times where you are the only one in the room um but you know and i answer that kind of twofolded but I do think it is about you at the end of the day. And it's okay to say it is about me, but ultimately it's br saying, what kind of, what value can I bring? What am I bringing to the table and making that be kind of the reason why is what I would say. Yeah, that's great. All right. I'm going to take one more audience question. Then we'll go back to a few of ours, um, our others planned. So Nadia, this is for you. Um, how can you gain trust and be more vocal at a new company that is a family company and male dominated? Sounds like our company. Um, <laughs> there are there are zero company resources or ERGs available or any other women, so to speak, who are available to connect with. That's a really good question. And I have been in that space many times. Uh, early before I actually came to Dish, I was working for I, I think I mentioned a small startup technology company. It was all males, um, and I kind of just found like, you know what? I fit because I wasn't afraid to speak my mind. Right? I wasn't afraid to ask questions to challenge things. So I would encourage, you know, you're going to gain that trust when you show you're competent, right? In areas whether that's asking questions. Um, whether that's offering, you know, suggestions, advice, that sort of thing. But I think you just can't be afraid, you know, to, um, you know, to ask for that seat at the table, if you will, you know, you're gonna, um, all of our industries, right. All of the ladies on this call, it is heavily male dominated. So we're all very familiar in working with that space. And I'm oftentimes I walk in a room and I'm the only person who looks like me. Right. Sometimes I'm the only woman, um, the only diverse person. And you just have to learn to be comfortable in that space. Doesn't mean it's right, but you have to be comfortable. Right. And, and I think, Liz, you kind of touched on something earlier where you said just accept what is right. So that's what it is. And how can I continue to influence? Well, I need to keep speaking my mind. I need to keep speaking up. And if I don't feel comfortable speaking in the room, maybe hey, let's take this offline. And maybe I meet with someone privately and say, here's some of my thoughts. How can I, you know, be more vocal, right? And, and, you know, and ask for advice that way. But just don't be afraid. And it's okay that you're the only one that looks like you, sounds like you, acts like you, whatever. That's okay. Just move to the next level of continuing to be yourself, continuing to be authentic and challenge. Yeah, that's great. Love that. All right, so I'm going to switch to... Um, Another question, Fairy Godboss has a tradition of asking this question to all of his panelists. So let's cover this. Um, and the question is, um, so Fairy Godboss has observed um, women often do not feel comfortable enough bragging or taking ownership of all of the amazing things that they achieve. If each of you could share with us accomplishments, personal or professional, that you're most proud of. So let's go to Kara. All right, I'm going to start with the example Carrie you used earlier, only because it ties back to what you said. Um, the first thing that I would tell this team um, when I think back of accomplishments, scream them from the rooftops. And that's a really weird thing to say on this call, but I've had over my career those moments where I'm like, why do we not talk about accomplishments as women um, and promote and champion and like support? It's it's not there. And, and we've got to do a better job of that. I know that that's a priority for me. But when I think about accomplishments, um, so I'll get off my soapbox with that. But my second thing that I, I'll go back to is the example you used. Um, you brought up the Property Brothers. We do a ton of uh, partnerships here at DISH. And when I think about the mark I've made here, so at some point, if you know, if and when I decide to leave here, the proudest thing is probably that partnership with our property brothers and why it's so important is not because they're cool. They are cool guys. It's because of the fact that um, when I first started here, I had an idea of, Hey, we have talent, we have shows that are really cool. We should do some stuff with, with some of the, the network opportunities that we have with the partners that we work with. And everyone was like, yeah, you can try that. That's probably never going to work. 
And so I started reaching out to our partners at HGTV. We had a business relationship with them. And for two and a half years, back and forth, I met, I traveled, I put business cases together, I pitched. I had no experience on any of this. But in my mind, I was like, this is a really cool idea. We should do this. Two and a half years, I was told no, I would guess seven, eight times, both internally here and externally from that brand. Nope, they're never going to do this. Not going to do, not going to do, not going to do. And I remember going back to the tenacity point that I said, that skill has been with me the entire time I've been here. I didn't stop swinging at the bat. And I was told no over and over and over again. And then I finally hit the ball and I didn't hit it big or small. I hit it really big. And why I share that with you all is that sometimes it takes that wall over and over again that you hit and you just cannot give up. And when I think about that, it's not my proudest moment because of Property Brothers. It's my proudest moment because we do about 50 partnerships a year. And it started as this little step that I believed in here. And not a whole lot of people backed me up here. It was like, you can kind of, you're kind of a little cray cray Kara, but go for it. Um, and I watched it go over the 17 years here to be something that I can leave here and know I've made my mark. I'm going to pass that to somebody else at some point and they're going to continue to grow and make it better and do all those things. But I know that if I didn't take that chance and, 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 you know, swing at the bat seven times that I would never hit the ball. And, you know, when I talk to our executive leadership team, they're like, Kara, that is one of those things here that you started. And I, that's a super proud moment for me because I look back and say, if I would have given up, it would never be to where it's at today. Um, and we try to do continue to grow it and do it better and better. But that's a tangible example where I look back and say, scream it from the rooftops. Super proud of it. Um, to Carrie's point, it's really cool. Um, but it also like tugs at my heartstrings because I know how much work I had to do to get it off the ground. And so that's a, that's an example I would use. Kind of fun, but very tangible based on what you commented on at the beginning. That's awesome. Yeah. That's going to be a hard act to follow. Uh, Nadia, <laughs> can you talk that? <laughs> that's right. a perfect segue. <laughs> and yes, I've not met the Property Brothers. I'm sure they're very, very cool. Um, I will share just a personal story. So it, it kind of ties back to one of my core values, right? That I'm, you know, I have grit and perseverance and resilience. We've talked a lot about that. But when my first son was born, I was very ill and had to go to the hospital and I was in a lot of pain. And the doctors knew they had to do surgery, but they needed like my levels to kind of stabilize. And I remember turning to the doctor and I asked, you know, Dr. Jones, how long am I going to be in here? And he said, well, it could be six weeks, could be six months. Now, mind you, I'm in ICU. I can't eat, can't drink for that entire time. Um, so he said, you got six weeks, anywhere from six weeks to six months. And without even blinking, I turned to him and I said, well, sign me up for the six week plan because we're going to be getting out of here, right? And so I stuck to my guns and I I did all the things I was supposed to do, right? The doctors would say, breathe in this tube, walk around, get your you know mobility, whatever. I did all the things I was supposed to do to make sure that I got out of there. And I actually got out of there in five weeks. And so, and I was near death, right? My, my circumstance. And so I, I consider that one of my proudest moments because it, it speaks to you know, the hard work and the, and the determination and my optimism, all those things that I kind of mentioned at the top of the call, like that's who I am. And that's what allowed me to get through that life or death experience. So that's way better than my example. Not really. <laughs> not really. <laughs> yes, I survived. That's a great thing. And I'd love to meet the property brothers. So I'm okay. putting on my <laughs> formal ask. So there you go. Next on the bucket list. <laughs> love it. Um, Liz, how about you? Yeah, I think, um, <clears throat> the thing I'm most proud about actually it did happen has is here at Dish. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, three, probably four years ago at this point, um, I had been uh, working as a marketing director at Dish. I think for about four years, three or four years. I had been in marketing for most of my career, um, and via you know, attrition and and having a coworker leave, I was put in a, a situation where I could significantly kind of pivot and take on totally new roles. So, and, and it didn't, it wouldn't necessarily oppose itself as an opportunity to everybody because it was all of a sudden like having, okay, this entire team is gone <laughs> and now I need to do the work. 
So I basically, you know, I pivoted, I, I learned uh, programming content, content negotiations. Uh, we took on a lot of work internally to really, uh, uh, to turn around and to refine our business. We did API integrations with our, uh, a lot of our partners overseas into the Sling app. We implemented an ad stack uh, or ad technology on top of, um, on top of our existing technology here at Sling. And this was over the course of really like 18 months when we got to the point, and I'm not kidding you, I worked every day straight for nine months. I took Christmas off. It was horrible. There's no way of sugarcoating that. Like no one wants to work that much. And I think people glorify it. Uh, if I look back personally, I think that was a really tough period. But what I learned in that period was new skills, but it was also the application of grit right? It's sort of like, here I am managing the smallest business at DISH. People are only going to tell me no. So what I have to do is I have to create the space of saying, no, we are going to do this because this is going to give us more money. It's going to give us more subscribers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it was only through taking on that volume of work, learning new things, going through and looking at the ways that we could innovate and build our business that I really got to a point of feeling like, wow, I've, I've, I've made it. Like I understand I get it. I feel like I can do anything um, and, and has really helped me really in what I'm doing now. It's really been very in, in, instrument of towards have, having that experience. But yeah, I don't talk about it. I talk about the work. <laughs> like I talk about the fact that I didn't see my family for nine months. Um, but the reality is, is that that was just a period of massive transformation. And it's because of me. I, 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 I don't ever say like, that was just me, but it was, I can confidently say that I had help from my coworkers. I had people who were supportive, but if I didn't do the work, it wasn't going to happen. That's great. Yeah. Thank you all for sharing that. Um, I'll share mine, just a, a quick story. Um, I, yeah, it's really hard to pick as you guys know, one thing, cause there's lots of little things. Um, but probably if I look back, um, I was, I'm most proud of myself of taking on a new position when I was feeling like the most uncomfortable. So I was um, working for Hewitt Associates, um, which they've been acquired and, and spun off a number of different um, names now, but they were all um, HR. So HR outsourcing and HR consulting, two arms of the business. I was on the outsourcing side of the business and the uh, business leaders came to me and, and asked me if I'd come over and take on um, building out a consulting practice. They wanted to go deep rather than broad around um, talent acquisition, workforce planning, um, consulting practice at a global level rather than at kind of a regional local level. And I'd never um, I'd done consulting, but um, in a, a different manner, not um, business consulting per se. And it was really uncomfortable for me. I was sort of like, why me? I, like, I don't really feel like I have the right skill sets for this, but someone thought I could do it. And so it made me really step back and say, if someone else thinks I could do it, why do I not think I could do it? Um, and so that was, it was a real learning lesson for me. Um, just from a career perspective that anytime now, anytime I feel uncomfortable about something, I know that feeling and I know I need to do it, um, especially when I don't feel comfortable with, confident with myself. And then I just use kind of the philosophy of like, fake it till you make it, right? Like I, um, you know, moved into like a principal consulting level and I had no idea what I was doing, um, but I did a lot of research. Um, you know, I met with a lot of people to understand, you know, what they did, how they how they became successful in that function, and um, I think ultimately, you know, built out a good consulting practice for the business that made money, and so I was really proud of that. Uh, but just it was probably more just the fact that I took on the challenge than anything else. Um, less about like the outcome, but I was I was you know I didn't I didn't crash and burn at the end of the day, and I thought I would, um, and, and it worked out. All right, so I'm going to take a couple other questions from the audience here. Um, one is, um, I would love to hear your perspective on claiming a seat at the table when you're going through the interview process. Um, the about me elevator pitch, I've tweaked several times based on the job description. What do you like to hear in the interview process? Um, so Nadia, maybe I'll, I'll ask you if there's anything that you can think of as a hiring manager and what you want to hear. 
I, you know, definitely, I, you know, I, I think having a diverse pool of applicants, right, to start, but one of the things I look for as a hiring manager is somebody who's going to be curious and ask questions. So I certainly look for those people who want to know more about the company, want to know more about what we do, and actually seem to care about those things rather than, oh, I'm just looking to get a job, right? Or, um, or I want to so, live in Denver. I'm sorry? <laughs> Or I just want to live in Denver. Yeah. yeah. I have had those. Yes. I have <laughs> had those as well. You know, and it is, it is challenging, but I think, you know, a lot of what we've talked about, right? Like being okay in certain spaces, right? You may be the only face that looks like you in an interview space. You know, you don't want to come, you know, don't be afraid to, oh, how might I come across, right? Other pe people are going to have certain perceptions, right? Whether I th saw one of the comments somebody asked about, you know, do I want to, I don't want to appear like, you know, that angry, angry black woman. Like it's just be authentically you, you know, and, and that's how I think you're best going to claim a seat at the table. Right. And you're going to ask questions, be curious, show that you, you're, you care and that you're interested as a hiring manager. I would want to follow up with someone who seemed curious and interested at, you know, and especially if they had some background and skill and could add to my team, I would be like, Hey, let's, let's do a follow-up. Let's have a second interview. Um, so those are a few things I would add. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, Kara, I'll um, come to you with the next one, which um, Nadia alluded, alluded to. In a male-dominated industry, how do you balance having opinions and authority without seeming aggressive or bitchy? Oh, that's a great question. It's, <laughs> it's a balance. Uh, yeah. You know, that's got to, we all giggle at, you know, the bitchiness. Like, that's what you're sort of up against at times of, you know, it's a good question. I would say when I think about some of the situations I've been in where I've made mistakes, where maybe I've come across too aggressive or too bitchy, <laughs> which I'm allowed to use that word because you asked that word. Um, but, you know, I would say in those situations, the more knowledgeable you are about what you're talking about, then it becomes less opinion based. It's more fact based of I'm able to communicate in a way that may be direct or aggressive, which I'm one of those people. I am more direct and aggressive. Like I like to win. I mentioned that. Um, but that can come across when you're knowledgeable about what you're communicating. It looks like you're just more driven versus bitchy. When you have a tendency to be more opinion based or more whiny or more gossipy or whatever words you want to use, that's where you have a tendency to fall more into the complainy bitchy mode versus when you have your stuff together and you're knowledgeable about what you're presenting, the argument, the data, the, um, the, the strategy, whatever, whatever you're trying to talk about, I would say the more prepared you are with, with the information, the better off it might become. But I will say that's, that's what we're all up against. All four of us are nodding our heads because, you know, you can go into a male dominated room, have an opinion at times when you're direct and aggressive, you may be looked at like the bitchy lady that's in the room that just wants it her way. And sometimes you just have to be confident to go, I don't care about that noise. And I look at it that way to say, if I'm knowledgeable about what I'm speaking about, I could care less if you want to call me an aggressive bitchy person. At the end of the day, people are always going to say or think that stuff. It's It goes back to not worrying about some of that stuff. And, you know, Liz talked about it at the very beginning. Just work through it. Get, push it aside. Push that noise mm -hmm. aside um, because it's always going to be there. I'm just going to say that. It's just being able to be confident to work through it and know your stuff. And if you know your stuff and you're presenting it in a confident way, I don't care if someone else thinks that, that that's the case. My goal is to try to get the job done and present the information in a, in a, in a, in a good way. Uh, that would be my advice to the group. Yeah. Um, I don't know if anybody else has any opinion on it, but that would be my advice. Yeah. yeah. I think it's, I think it's such a trope, honestly. Like it's like the strong woman becomes the bitch. Don't worry about it. Frankly, <laughs> like if yeah. you're, I agree with you, Kara, if you're buttoned up, you know what you're talking about. Yeah. It's hard though. You should it's be, assertive. Hard. you should be assertive. Yeah, should. totally. Yep. You should champion yourself, yeah. be assertive, be confident, yeah. and don't care what other people think. Um, and if you're, yeah. if you have people that do care, find other people around you that support you that know what you're trying to accomplish, what I would say. I absolutely agree with the ladies. And I, I would add, you know, don't get so hung up on how, 
how you want to be perceived, right? Like, like have the confidence, like take chances. One of my models, and I'll just say it on this call is GSD, right? Get shit done, right? And sometimes <laughs> you have to be assertive. You have to be maybe a little bitchy. You may have to be a little bit of a know-it-all. That's okay. I don't really care because I'm trying to get to that goal that's right over yep. there and I'm super competitive. So I feel like Kara, you and I need to like, right? Like we need to, I don't know, like I'm competitive as well, but like <laughs> at the end of the day, right? Like my motto drives me, right? I want to get shit done. So I don't care about the noise, right? I push it to the side and however you want to perceive me, whatever you think my brand is, you think it is, right? It doesn't change who I think I am. So. Yeah. And the comical thing on that is you'll hear, leaders that are typically not women that are men that will complain at times to say oh she was too pushy oh she was too aggressive oh she's constantly trying to win and get my way but they're going to be the first person when you're available for a role on their team to come and find you because they want you on their team and that's kind of the the, the funny part about it is you're like you don't want it one way but yet when it comes to getting stuff done like not to mention you want me there so it's you know i i would agree with i would agree with you it's push it out of the way. Don't, don't focus on it. Keep yeah. driving towards what you're trying to drive towards, because if you let that noise in the way, it's going to eat you alive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love it. So we're nearing the end. Um, I'll ask the last question of each of you, which is what advice would you give your younger self? So Liz, let's start with you. Yeah. Um, it's funny, Kara. I think I had this question at a <laughs> recent offsite. Um, but yeah. I would say, you know, it's funny because I, I, um, I think when I was starting out that I, I, I felt like I was going to get to a point where I was just like done. Right. Like, uh, you know, now I fully arrived as an adult. Uh, I would say that I don't really still feel like I'm there. So the advice I would give to my, and I don't think that's a bad thing. Like, I think we are all works in progress. The advice I would give to my younger self is just keep going, keep developing, keep learning, keep, gravitating towards what interests you and drives you and don't worry about the destination because I don't think you ever arrive. Yeah. But maybe you do. Maybe, maybe it's just me, but that, that it, I think it keeps people going. Yeah. yeah. Not yet. Yeah. I would say always be curious and be courageous. You know, I, I think oftentimes we start a career and we think, Oh, I'm really good at this. I'll just kind of stay in this realm and I don't want to get out of my comfort zone. And I would encourage my younger self to do that more because oftentimes when people do get out of that comfort zone, they're more likely to be promoted. They're more likely to take on those new things, get those new cool projects, meet the property brothers, right? Like all of those things. Um, but if you stay with what you're comfortable and fixed and you don't expand your horizons, um, less opportunities to grow. So I say, stay, stay curious, stay courageous. Mm -hmm. Kara, how about you? Yeah. Um, I had an initial answer and I'm going to change it because, you know, and, and talking through this, y'all are sparking some different things in my head. You know, all of us are very driven. You can tell that on this phone, phone call, you know, we're all, you know, about getting the job done and getting project work done and being driven and all those things. And, you know, I look back at my last 25 years of corporate work or work in general, and there are times where I wish I didn't take myself or my job so serious. Because there's so many other things in life, and I do have a family as well with two kids, that I look back and say, it really didn't matter. Something else mattered. Or, you know, I was driving towards a certain goal and I got really upset because I didn't get that promotion or that salary pr raise or whatever. And I look back and I'm like, is it really nothing of a deal? Because there's a lot of other things in life that are just as important, if not more important, than the work that we all do. And we all take our careers very serious, but my answer would be, don't take everything so serious because at the end of the day, we're all going to not have jobs and work at some point in our lives. And we're going to look back and we're going to say, why, why did I do all that? Um, and so I think it's, it's important to kind of have some of that self-reflection at times. And I wish I had that kind of looking back in my twenties to go, Kara, don't be so, so serious, like have fun, learn, grow, make relationships in the business you know, workplace and meet people and, and have fun and learn and be curious to all the, you know, everything that everyone's saying that, that would be what I would say to my 25 year old coming into the job market self is not so serious all the time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
Well, that is fabulous. Thank you all. We're at the close of our webinar here. Thanks, um, Kara, Liz, Nadia, for spending an hour with us to talk through this. Um, I found it very meaningful myself, even as the moderator. Um, thank you all for joining us in uh, this webinar as well um, and tuning into the discussion. As a reminder, we'll be sending out a recording of today's event along with resources to learn about Opportunities at DISH, of course, our company. Um, and be sure to check out DISH's profile and jobs on Fairy God Boss. We'd love to hear from you. And um, if you have a few minutes, uh, Fairy God Boss would appreciate feedback if you want to take a look at the type form tab on the right of your screen to share your thoughts in a one survey. Thanks everyone. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Okay.